There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in his place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise.
God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship. You are here, you're mending every heart. I worship you. stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working, you never stop, no, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, no, you never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness.
did you say? What have you done for me lately? What have you done to earn my grace? And I've never heard you speak anything but your love for me, anything but
I can always count on you. What a friend I found in you, Jesus. What a friend I found in you. When no one else could keep their promise, I can always count on you. What a friend I found in you, Jesus. What a friend I found in you. When no one else could keep their promise, I can always count on you. As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above every fear. Like the sun shaping the shadow, in my weakness, your glory. Lord is in this place. 
just so grateful that you've met us here where we are, that you fill this place, and we just thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy and what you're about to do. We are in our verse-by-verse -verse study of John chapter 6 today, and uh, we've been going through this study, and uh, it's titled The Bread from Heaven, and it's probably one of my most favorite chapters of the Bible. There's just so much meat in here for us to draw from. And last week, we saw Jesus engaging the people and telling them that he was the bread of life, and we saw this perplexity within this crowd of people, and it's because they weren't understanding what he was really saying. And I think part of the reason, and we're going to tap into this this morning, is because they knew who he was. They knew who Jesus was. They knew how he had grown up. Let me start by asking a question. Have you ever thought, who in the world does that person think they are? I think we're all guilty of that. Somebody says something or does something, and we know them, and we think, who do you think you are, right? You're not the president. You're not this. You're not that. We have the tendency to do that. We've known them. We've grown up with them. Maybe we've worked with them, and then, then something happens or something is said, and, and they're thinking, wow, really? Who are you to think or say that? Today, Jesus is going to encounter this after making his statement last week about being the bread of life. And once again, Jesus is going to take the time to try to explain to this crowd of people, and specifically the Jewish leaders, what he is talking about. At the end of Jesus' discourse, it's going to have a tremendous impact on the crowd, and more importantly, it's going to have a tremendous impact on his disciples, and many of them are going to make a life-altering choice. The title of today's message is, Isn't He Ordinary? Let's open up our Bibles, our tablets, or whatever we have, or we'll have it up here on the screen. We're going to start in John chapter 6, verse 41. It reads, At this the Jews there began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, 
I came down from heaven. So we see that Jesus, after he talks about being the bread of life, the bread from heaven, that the crowd immediately begins to grumble. They're not understanding the meaning of what Jesus is saying. And so instead of asking for clarity, they start grumbling. People do this all the time, right? This is what we do. We don't understand something or we mistakenly take something in. And instead of asking for more detail and clarity, we grumble. He doesn't know what he's talking about. That's a stupid idea. Who does she think she is saying that? Listen, there's one thing that I've lived by, and it's this. When unsure, ask. Communication alleviates frustration. It alleviates it. People get irritated with me because I'm going to ask 20 questions until I understand what it is that's going on or what you're saying. Sometimes I over-communicate, but I'd rather over-communicate than not communicate enough, and then people are like, well, what's going on here? And as they're grumbling, they are going to ask two questions. Verse 42 says, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? So they're asking this question like, hey, basically they're saying, we know the family. We know who these people are. Maybe some of them have known Jesus his whole life. Remember, this was a region that Jesus had grown up in. Many times we equate people to where they're from or who their family is. Well, they're from very little, so they can't be very important. Or, wow, they've got great, great, great wealth. They, obviously, they've got great impact and importance. And we seem to equate money, wealth, popularity, social status with having this profound impact. While others who may have less means, live less of an extravagant life, or just flat out are poor, as if they're insignificant and have no worth. The people complained and grumbled about Jesus thinking what he said about himself was too big, too exalting. Who is this guy to say this? And then they ask, how can he now say, I came down from heaven? Again, because of his meager means. His father was just an ordinary guy, a mason. He didn't have social status or wealth. He's just a local boy. How could Jesus even think in these terms? That I came down from heaven. How could he think that? I like what Merrill C. Tinney said. Again, he's a theologian from the mid-20th century. He said, six times in this immediate context, Jesus says that he came down from heaven. He says it in verses 33, 38, 41, 50, 51. He's going to say it in 58. His claim to heavenly origin is unmistakable. It was unmistakable what Jesus was saying. You would think that they would have grasped it. But here was the problem. This is one of the real-life difficulties of the contemporaries of Jesus at that time. The Messiah was to come in the clouds suddenly to appear. But Jesus had quietly grown up among them. Now, Jesus is going to return in the clouds. He is going to suddenly appear. And when he does, everything's going to change. But Jesus had grown up among them. So how could Jesus have grown up among them and say that he is, in essence, this Messiah, this bread of life? It confounded them. Verse 43 reads, Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now he's repeating what he had just said earlier. It is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father 
and learn from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who was from God. Only he has seen the Father. So now Jesus is going to explain and, and get into detail why they're rejecting him. But the first thing he tells them is basically, shut up. Stop grumbling. Shut up. Listen. Stop grumbling and listen. Some of you this morning need to stop grumbling and, mi- and listen. I'm just going to keep it real with you. Australian pastor Leon Morris said this, Grumbling indicates discontent. That's what it always indicates. It is the confused sound that runs through a crowd when they are angry and in opposition. And that's what was going on here. They were angry. They were in opposition. But more importantly, they were confused. They were confused. And Jesus is saying, just be quiet. Stop with your preconceived notions and listen to what I'm telling you. No one can come to me unless the Father who sends me draws them. He's reminding them of this this truth. Why? Because in Jewish thought, they were already chosen by God by virtue of their physical and natural birth. Now, there is truth in that. God did choose them. And he still continues to choose the nation of Israel. He's looking out over them, even in these atrocities that are happening in Israel. It is not going by by the Father's eyes. It's not like he's not seeing them. He's not turning a blind eye. He will do something in all of this. I know he will. But Jesus wanted to make it clear that although nationally you are God's people, it's still deeper than that. It's about a relationship. And Jesus made it clear that God must draw them before they can come to God. It's not based on your birthright, man. It's based on the drawing of God, you being drawn in by God and coming into a relationship with him. Everyone who responds to the Father will respond to the Son. That's what he's telling them. Verse 44, see, he says, then Jesus reminds them that he's brought uh, that those brought to him by the Father will be raised up on the last day. And then he says something interesting in 45. It is written in the prophets. Now he's bringing the prophets in. They will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. Now, Jesus is quoting out of Isaiah 54, 13, where Isaiah talks, is telling the people that, that uh, they will be taught by God. And so Jesus is basically saying all those who belong to God are taught by God. And in essence, they should know and understand what he's saying. I like what Charles Spurgeon said here. He says, this was as much to say as, or this was as much as to say, the Father has never taught you. You have learned nothing from him, or you would come to me, but in your rejection of me, you prove that you are strangers to the grace of God. Wow. Think about that. If we're taught by God, we're not going to reject who Jesus is. And we're not going to be strangers to the grace of God. We're going to embrace the grace of God because we're going to realize it's the grace of God that has brought us into this life-giving relationship with Jesus. He then tells them that he is the only one who has seen the Father because he is from God. Now, this causes strife with those in the Jewish circle there. Jesus is talking about this unique relationship between him and God the Father. And he's trying to convey this to him. But here's the problem. Is that without truly understanding that there is a Godhead, that there's more than one person in the Godhead, they're not able to grasp this fact. Here's the sad part about this. Is that although some of these books are not in our Bible, There is a lot of Jewish apocalyptic apocalyptic literature 
that was written by Jewish people during the Second Temple period. And in it, it describes many, many cases of this Son of Man, this Son of Man in the heavenly realms. And that this Son of Man was equal with God. And that he had authority and that he was worshipped as God. You can find that in the books of Enoch and in the books of Barak. Great books, they're great reference points, they're great ways for you to kind of study and understand the Second Temple period of Judaism. And all that was available to them. Remember, the canonized Bible didn't happen until like 1100 A.D. There were all these writings they should have seen, they should have known. Verse 47, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I want you to catch this, church. He says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. Now he's going to bring this up about the ancestors. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, and anyone may eat and not die. Jesus is saying, I'm here. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever forever. This bread is my flesh, listen to what he's saying, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, Jesus once again explains he is the bread of life. And he tells him whoever eats this bread will live forever. Driving home this point, driving home this point, driving home this point. And then Jesus comes back to what they had said earlier. Remember earlier, a couple weeks back, last, or last week, when they said that Moses gave us bread to eat in, in the wilderness. And Jesus says, ah, that bread didn't come from Moses, man. It came from God. Let's get that straight. Now he's going to go back and talk about the ancestors again who got this bread. And he tells them something very, very pointed. He says, yeah, they got bread, but they're dead. See, this bread didn't give them eternal life. It sustained them on a daily basis, but it did not give them an eternal living. Jesus says, I am the living bread. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for life to the world. Jesus says, look, this is what's going to give you life. My flesh. My flesh is going to give you life. And I'm going to give it for the world. Now, Christians throughout history have taken this passage as speaking of the Christian practice of communion. The Lord's table is instituted by Jesus on the night before his crucifixion, which, which it, it, yes, this is what we're talking about here. But here's the thing. Many have thought that receiving the bread and the cup of the Lord's table is essential for salvation and that all who do are guaranteed salvation. Church, this is not true. Communion does not guarantee salvation. It doesn't guarantee salvation, man. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. Paul never wrote that. Paul wrote in in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when he talks about the Lord's Supper. He repeats what Jesus said. He said, do this in remembrance of me. When we take communion, we're remembering what Jesus has done for us. We remember that Jesus gave up his broken body and blood for us. In giving of his flesh to the world, Jesus was pointing to his death on the cross. This is what he's talking about. His act on the cross is what brings salvation, not our act of taking communion. And unfortunately, there are many churches that teach that when you take communion, you're receiving Jesus and, you're, and, and, and that's salvation. It's not. That's not in Scripture. It's not there. Verse 52. Then Jesus began to argue sharply. Oh, no, the Jews, I'm sorry, began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Good question. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, 
You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Hmm. Central theme. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And he said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. So the Jews begin to argue among themselves, these Jewish leaders. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, I think it's probable that the Jewish leaders willfully misunderstood Jesus at this point. You know, you can willfully misunderstand something. You can unknowingly misunderstand something. But I think you can willfully misunderstand something. You just don't want to understand it. You're set in how you think about things, and you just don't want to understand it. Here's the thing. Jesus had just explained that the bread was his body that would be given as a sacrifice for his life of of the world. He just explained that in John chapter 6, verse 51. But the way this is written here, the tense that's used in this text in the Greek, it seems to point that these Jewish leaders were almost willfully twisting his words to imply some kind of a bizarre cannibalism, which was just absolutely blaspheme to a Jew. And then Jesus tells him, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He's like looking, he's like, guys, listen to what I'm telling you. Listen to me. Listen to my words. I want to explain this in the best way that I can. My my flesh My flesh is the bread that's going to be laid down. See, listen, the bread of life is a metaphor. Church, it's a metaphor. Bread from heaven is a metaphor. Living bread is a metaphor. Bread of God is a metaphor. These are metaphors that Jesus is using to drive home the point. So Jesus extends this bread metaphor to his actual soon-to-come sacrifice on the cross. This is what Jesus is doing. Listen, the crucified and risen Jesus must be received and eternal, internalized, metaphorically eating, taking in. Like when you eat, you take something into your body, and it becomes part of your being. When you eat something, the nutrients that, that are in the food go into your body. Why? To fuel it. And this is what he's trying to tell them, that listen, you need my flesh, my blood, who I am. You need it. Otherwise, you will have no spiritual life and no eternal life. These guys should have got it. Because the eating of the flesh and the drinking of the blood was a plain allusion to the sacrificial idea in the Torah. Those questioning Jesus were well versed in the sacrificial system. They understood how it worked. They understood the blood and the flesh concept of the sacrifices. And so Jesus is using something that they should relatively have known. But yet they willfully misunderstood it. Jesus goes on to say, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. What he's telling him is that my life, the sacrifice life, my sacrifice life is food and drink for the hungry and the thirsty soul. Some of you are thirsty and hungry this morning and you need to feast on Jesus. You're feasting on everything else. 
You're feasting on what the doctor says. You're feasting on what the counselor says. You're feasting on what social media says. You're feasting on what CNN says. You're feasting on what your best friend says. But you're not feasting on Jesus. You're allowing all these other things to feed your soul, your mind, and your heart. And what you need to do is you need to feed on Jesus. He's the only one who can quench your thirst and take away your hungry pains. Verse 57 says, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Church, we need to feed on Jesus daily. We need to spend time with him. We need to be in his word. And when we do, we abide in him and we live because of him. Some of you cannot make it through the day because you don't have Jesus where he needs to be at in your life. The only time you feed on Jesus is when you're in need or when you're in a bad situation or when you need help or when you have a problem. But you need to feed on Jesus every single day. As you eat three times a day or four times a day or some of us like me six times a day, um, you need to eat. You need to feed on Christ. But you feed on everything else. My gosh, I listen to the conversations in this church. I know what you all feed on. I rarely hear Jesus conversations. I rarely hear them. I hear everything else. And that tells me what you're feeding on, man. It tells me what you're focused on. And I get it. This is a world that we live in. But how can we have, how can we not be bringing up Jesus, man? I don't understand. It's because we don't feed on him like we need to. He's not the centrality of our lives. He's a part or an aspect of our lives. But he's not the centrality, church. And the only one responsible for that is you and me. It's us. Jesus becomes a priority when he's the priority. But a lot of times Jesus is just the priority when we got a problem or we got a need. Or I don't have enough money. Or I'm going to go grumble to Jesus because I don't have enough money. Or whatever it is. But Jesus says, no, if you feed on me, you will live. You will live because of me. John says in verse 59, and he said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. So this discourse of Jesus that started in verse 26 It happened in the synagogue. When he got over to the other side in Capernaum, everything that we've read so far happened inside the synagogue. It didn't happen on the seashore in the open space. And so most likely Jesus was given the opportunity to speak to the people during the time of gathering in in the synagogue, expounding on the scripture reading for that day. So typically what would happen is on the Sabbath that they would show up, they would come in, and and they would already have a... uh, a scripted out portion of of scripture for that day and that they would do it for the whole year the catholic church kind of follows the same thing right they'll have a a scripted out part of the bible that they're going to share on that sunday well they would do the same thing uh, in the jewish synagogue is that they would have a portion of the torah that would be written or, or excuse me read and then the the rabbi who was reading it would expound on its meaning And so it appears that on that day that Jesus was asked to speak because he was a rabbi. He was asked to speak, and he's expounding on the reading of the day. And he quite possibly might have been in Isaiah 54. And maybe that's why he quoted 54 and and, and kind of... In John's mind, that's what stood out in what he said when he talked about the prophets and being taught by God. But here's the crazy thing. There's little doubt that this transpired on the Sabbath. And how ironic that the bread of life is speaking on the Sabbath about salvation through a sacrificed blood. Isn't it crazy how God puts everything together? Jesus shows up at the right time. He walks into the synagogue on the Sabbath. He's asked to read, and when he opens up the word, 
it has to do with the fact that it's talking about the bread in some way, some shape or form. It was the bread. Maybe it was the bread in the wilderness. I don't know, but it was there. In closing, church, there's times that Jesus' teachings seem to, be, seem to be hard to understand, right? There's a lot of times I read things in the Bible and I go, man, that don't make sense. And there's things that I personally struggle with that the Bible, that the Bible says, right? I, I, I struggle with certain things, but yet that's, that's my flesh. That's my earthly thinking. And if I had God's mind, it would make perfect sense to me. Maybe today you're still kind of confused on this bread of life thing. For the last two weeks, we've been talking about it. Let me sum it up to you in the clearest and easiest way that I can. God loves you very much, and he wants you to have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus. That's what this is all about. Everything that Jesus was saying was about the relationship. And he talks about the relationship that him and his father have. And that same relationship is available to us through Jesus. When we accept what Jesus has done, it changes everything. And so today, you need to partake of the flesh and blood of Jesus by asking him to be your Lord and Savior. Romans 10.9 says this, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here's the key part about what, John, what Paul's writing there. He says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. See, that's, that's a hard one for us. We don't have a problem calling him Savior. We like the idea that he saved us. That's a great idea. Hey, you saved me, man. I, yeah. But to call him Lord means that he's master. To call him Lord means that he rules over your life. See, Lord changes the relationship. I like Lord and Savior because Jesus is my master and he is my Savior. But for some of you this morning, he's just your Savior. You've never taken that step towards calling him Lord. I struggled with that for many, many years of my walk with Jesus. But when you call him Lord, that means you surrendered all. You surrendered everything. See, you may have been a Christian for a long time, but you've never really surrendered to the Lord. You still do what you used to do, think like you used to think, talk like you used to talk, and then you come to, to, to church on Sunday, and you Christianese everything, and everything's good, and you got your Jesus moment, and then you walk back out into the world, but that is not what this is about. Jesus says, you must feed on me daily. Which means tomorrow, when you wake up in the morning, you need to feed on Jesus. That means tomorrow afternoon, you need to feed on Jesus. That means tomorrow night, you have to feed on Jesus. That means on Tuesday, you have to feed on Jesus. And Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. It's not just feeding on Jesus when we come here for a magical hour. It's not that. It's feeding on him daily. Daily. I encourage you today, if you've been playing the Christian game, to start feeding on Jesus. He wants you so desperately. He wants you so badly. He's given everything for you and I. But the first step is realizing that he's the bread of life and that it's more than just saying I'm a Christian and it's more than saying that I believe in God. It's calling him Lord. You're my master. You're the one who owns me. You're the one who controls my life. There's going to be men and women up here to pray for you this morning. And I would ask that you don't walk out of here if you have a need, I would ask that you don't walk out of here if you need to get things squared up with Jesus. I know it's hard to come up front because people think, wow, what are they thinking about me? But you know what? 
Going to the altar is not weakness, it's strength. It's strength. It's realizing that I'm not strong enough and I need more of Jesus. I need more of God. And it takes strength to walk that four or five feet. But that's the strength that you want to have. You want to come to the Lord. You want to come to God. You want to get it straight. Let today be the day that you begin feeding on Christ. Amen? Amen. Have a great Sunday. Deuces.